Hello everybody. Today I'd like to share some of my favorite mods, rules adjustments, and gameplay tips for Conquest of the Empire, another old school classic board game from the 1980s by Milton Bradley. Conquest of the Empire loosely portrays the decline of Roman civilization as six separate player factions fight a civil war for ultimate control over the ancient Mediterranean realm. This is a dudes on a map area control contest. Territories are worth money called talents here and talents pay for the units to make war on your neighbors. So it's a simple concept, but one set in ancient times with a great presentation which comes with some really cool design features as well. I've had a lot of fun playing this game over the years, and I argue that with some rules adjustments and gameplay modifications, you can turn Conquest of the Empire into a truly awesome gaming experience. <clears throat> now, it got a mega reprint facelift reimagination by Eagle Games in 2005. So the question becomes, is the classic big box version by Milton Bradley still worth playing today? I say yes, definitely yes. I have a lot to say about this game too. I really like it. So first, I need to briefly go over and explain some important details that are relatively unique to Conquest of the Empire. So you can understand why certain things about the game made it much less popular overall than its bigger brother, Axis and Allies. Now, as a game, I feel it's as good as it gets for its time and genre. But for most people, the subject matter is way more distant and obscure. The action is set in the second century AD and doesn't really attempt to accurately replicate any historical sequence of events. And I think that's one reason why it's not as popular today. Another thing that a lot of people don't like about the game is the fact that the plastic pieces become brittle with age and they break. And I've never seen this problem before in any other game. And it's a bummer because I think they look awesome. It is it is what it is. I don't let it bother me too much, but I can see why it would annoy other people. Um, I recommend swapping in new pieces from other sets if you can't stand the broken catapult arms or broken spear tips on your plastic minis. Anyway, let's look at the map. It looks beautiful in real life when it's set up on the table. There's just nothing like it. You'll notice at the bottom an inflation track. It's a built-in destabilizing mechanism that prevents your games from dragging on and on. And the first time any power's economy breaks the 100 talent threshold, the price of all units, doubles beginning on the next player's turn and this is permanent the second inflation barrier triggers at 200 talents and at this point in the game the price of all units triples until the game is over and this feature works well it's really cool and it's one of the unforgettable details about this game and i should mention the game ends when there is only one caesar unit left standing so speaking of units, there are only four different kinds of combat pieces players can buy. There's legions, the men, cavalry, horse, catapults, siege engines, and triremes, the boats. So players can also buy cities and walls for cities. They increase income. And in the latter case, they also provide defensive bonuses. Inflation also affects city construction and wall construction. Roads automatically appear between two cities built in adjacent provinces, and they allow for free movement, basically. Okay, so the way combat works is also rather unique. There are D6s, but no buckets of D6. It's a sequential process that favors the attacker for the most part. <clears throat> the attacker targets a unit and then rolls a single D6 to see if they get a hit. And if they do, the defender removes their piece first and then gets the fire back, also declaring a target. The sequence goes back and forth until one side wins and one side loses. 
and the attacker has the option of retreating after a combat round, but for two exceptions. All naval battles are to the death, and amphibious landings also don't allow for retreats. Catapults are the most expensive units, and they are the hardest to hit. You need to roll a 6 face on a d6 to destroy a catapult. Also, for every catapult in an army, a player gets a plus 1 to their die rolls. But if attacker and defender both have one, the combat advantages cancel out. So for every catapult you have in a battle that your opponent doesn't have, an accumulation of plus ones in combat rolls takes place. And so now we have arrived at the most controversial aspect of Conquest of the Empire. So if you go online, you'll see a lot of positive reviews, but you'll also see a fair share of negative reviews. And virtually all of the negative reviews highlight catapults as being a massive problem with this game. So people say they're overpowered, people say they break the game, they say Conquest of the Empire is nothing more than he or she who has the most catapults wins, period. Okay, so first I'd like to share some of my thoughts on this controversy, and then list some rules adjustments you might try with this game regarding this issue, even if you disagree with everything I'm about to say on this subject. So I admit catapults are powerful, too powerful. I think it's debatable, broken. I don't see it. I don't see it, honestly. I played this game quite a bit with various player counts. And every time at least one player tries this catapult grand slam thing, and almost always they're forced to walk it back. So there is always talk and in-game propaganda about how someone's going to steamroll you with this strategy. But in reality, the unexpected happens. They'll need to cover a number of territories in an emergency. Inflation starts to bite. And that plan goes straight out the window. Secondly, other players can counter it in at least a couple of ways. You build one. I build one. Where's your advantage now? Oh, by the way... Mine are going to be parked behind walled cities that also provide their old, own combat advantage. So have fun attacking me at a disadvantage, no matter how you bring, how many you bring to, you know, siege my city, walled city. There is also almost uh, this weird gambler's fallacy about this strategy that bothers me. There's an assumption that as a defender, I can't roll a six face on a d6 with multiple attempts before you get your money's worth out of a catapult. So just pray to Jupiter that I don't roll a six, I guess. Siege engines are quadruple the cost of legions. So as a defender, I might have four shots at every catapult if you miss on your first roll, even with your combat advantage. If you just buy catapults, your armies will be under strength and you won't be able to field as many units as your opponents, potentially. And lastly, if you do decide to stockpile catapults, then how are you not the biggest threat in the game the second after you have one more than everybody else? How are both powers on either side of you not taking notice of this? You may find yourself trying to fend off multiple opponents at the same time on your very next turn. After all, alliances are fluid in this game. They're not fixed. You could go from an expanding superpower to hanging on for dear life if and when the winds of war shift against you. So I think the idea that catapults are broken in this game is unfair. This is an oversimplified, overstated generalization. And I just came up with several, several equally um, oversimplified counter arguments. So there, <laughs> oftentimes I find these game hacks too tend to be techniques that simply raise the stakes in certain situations. Anyway, yes, they're powerful. The catapult slam is one way to play the game. All I'm saying is try it against multiple experienced opponents and see what happens. <laughs> A guaranteed victory, I'm not so sure. Uh, fortunately, though, several super fans of this game have come to the rescue over the years um, to offer up some fantastic, super easy to use 
uh, rules adjustments that anybody can implement if they maintain the standard rules are broken. So suggestion number one, you may declare a limit on the number of allowed catapults per army. Armies in this game can be up to seven units in size, plus a general piece, which gives an army the ability to move. You could say each army is limited to one, two, or three siege engines to alleviate combat advantage superabundance. Suggestion number two, and I like this one a lot. You could say only a three-piece set of one man, one horse, and one siege unit per army results in a plus one combat advantage. So the max combat advantage per army would be plus two, since a general can only command seven units total at a time. So it's a combined set of arms that results in advantages. And suggestion number three, and this is the one that I use. It's known as the Burns House Rules Package found on BGG. And it states that catapults must be screened by either foot or horse units, one to one ratio. Otherwise they get hit on a four plus instead of a six. And it makes sense and it works well in practice. Also Burns suggests making cavalry 20 talents instead of 25 talents a piece to start. And this is another great suggestion that I use. 10 for foot, 20 for horse, 40 for siege units. It's easier to remember anyway. And finally, if you're still a hater of combat advantages, then maybe play without it. Just have walled cities as bonus givers. Strip the catapults of the advantage altogether and see what happens. So you can see why I'm hesitant to declare the game broken when the suggested rules adjustments are so easy to use and they all make perfect sense and they're all super clever. Okay, so we've heard about all the land units and their related complaints. What about the ships and naval combat? Well, simply put, naval combat is heavily abstracted in this game. It's the same as land combat for the most part, except the ships themselves can't be targeted until all the other units are dead and there are no retreats and horse units defend extra poorly when on boats. Okay, so here's the problem in my opinion. The original rules fail to concisely explain exactly how ships are supposed to move and fight. It's multiple pages with diagrams and convoluted long-winded explanations, but it's still strangely disorienting the way the information is presented. So here's my suggestion. Reduce these rules to eight simple sentences, basically. Boats transport armies across sea zones, one army per boat. Boats can move up to two sea spaces in one turn. Armies cannot, cannot move over land before or after they board a boat on a turn. Loaded boats must remain at sea for one turn before they unload on the next turn. So there's no bridging or anything like that. It's better this way. Triremes were dangerous in real life. Expose all naval expeditions to the dangers of the sea for at least one turn. That way other powers can mess with each other and trigger naval battles more readily. So you load a ship, move up to two spaces, or one perhaps, into sea combat, or perhaps not. On your next turn, you make landfall or travel further by sea. That's it. Like land territory, territories, sea zones cannot be shared or occupied by two or more factions. They must be fought over. Boom. Try it out. So this brings us to the final large issue with this game. That is less controversial, yet most people acknowledge it as a concern. And that is the scripted nature of the overall gameplay with respect to the predictability of final outcomes. In other words, whatever the player count, you just know that a couple of the factions aren't likely to be around at the end of the game. Specifically Italia, specifically Egyptus, they are just not likely to survive for very long at all. Why? Well, it's just a byproduct of geography. Both factions are pinched badly between potentially dangerous adversaries. Neither faction has a lot close by that won't be hotly contested right from the start. Other powers are comparatively remote or have access to backwater or frontier territories that typically, typically don't see much action. 
And furthermore, the turn sequence is a clockwise progression. And you could make the argument that the turn order only exacerbates the inherent weakness of certain powers like Italia that go last. So if this part of the game bothers you, I suggest altering the turn order. Make a player aid that clearly shows how your adjusted turn order plays out. I suggest having Italia play first, Egypt is second, Numidia third, Macedonia fourth, Galatia fifth, and Hispania last. Uh, we used to play this adjusted turnover, turn order fairly often, and I remember it made a noticeable difference too. I don't really use this adjustment anymore though because I found something else I like even better. And I don't have complaints about similar final outcomes anymore. So around 2001, people started posting random events tables and charts and similar mods for Conquest of the Empire to BGG. And over the years, these became more and more refined and polished. So nowadays you can print off a few really cool charts with rule ex rules explanations that really add so much enjoyment to the original base game. These add random events to your game. This is the way I like to implement them. I make every faction roll for an event at the very start of the turn. If the faction is on the copper inflation track, a one result on a 1d6 roll trips a random event. If the faction is on the silver inflation track, a one to two result on a 1d6 roll trips a random event. And the random event triggers on a one to three 1d6 roll if a power reaches the gold track. So this mod just magnifies the whole destabilizing feature of the game. If a player triggers a random event, they roll two different colored D6s. One die represents the tens, and the second die represents just uh, one to six. So the random events chart has 36 possible outcomes. So here's an example. You just roll the dice like this. The first one is a five. The second one is another five. So you put them together, look up the result. It says famine and then you read the description and it just says famine strikes one province chosen at random using the province selection table the phasing player rolls 1d6 for each combat unit in that province on a result of four to six that unit is remo removed from the board so that's fairly simple and then once you know what happens, you have to locate the random event with a similar die rolling process on the random seas and random provinces selection chart and then apply the effect. So an example here, first die roll is a six, second die roll is a six. So that is that would happen in Sicilia, according to the chart. Um, so it's really interesting, too, because some of these effects may harm your opponents or they might unexpectedly help or hinder your plans right before you take your turn. I use the charts on BGG, but I also added my own modifications and ideas. And all of these ideas are so interesting and funny too. Some of my favorite examples are, um, you can get an inferno in your capital city. You can recruit elephants, which I really like. And I'll just, um, read the description here briefly i use minis i think it was from age of empires board game i have them so elephant recruitment if you get this result five elephant units become immediately become available for recruitment there are only five after they are destroyed they become extinct elephants cost 30 60 or 90 talents depending on inflation level on the tribute collection track elephants are recruited in open provinces that are without roads or cities elephants may never enter a territory with a city elephants are six to hit on land and four plus on a ship elephant equipped legions eliminate two enemy infantry barbarian or slave units per each successful hit um, hit overages are ignored if remaining units are not enemy foot, foot soldiers and cavalry alone may not face an elephant equipped legion. So a defending legion reduced to only cavalry units must withdraw immediately, if so reduced by a legion equipped with elephants. Because everyone knows horses hate elephants. <laughs> so uh, 
yeah, you can have slave revolts. So you can add the Spartacus element to the game. Barbarians, pirates, plagues, famine, everything. Everything you can imagine. So with the ra random events in play, no two games need ever be the same again. They're so intuitive and easy to use, and the basic charts are free to download. So honestly, how can you go wrong here? If you get hosed by random events in one game, you can always use that in, as an excuse for losing, and then there's an incentive for an immediate rematch. More games of Conquest of the Empire is never bad. The last game I played, I remember a flood washed out uh, the province between Egyptus and Numidia at a key moment. There were tons of pirates floating around causing havoc in the seas. A lot of the small islands became off limits basically because they exploded with multiple slave revolts. I even soloed this game using the random events table just to get a sense of what could happen and just to observe the chaos. It's just great. So once you have your modifications going, make sure to get and use additional player aids that are freely available on BGG also. They can really help to get thing, keep things organized, especially when playing with new features that add a lot more stuff to your experience. So here are the ones I like and use. I use a battle board. So you move pieces onto this when they fight and it has uh, spaces for triremes, the horses, the legions, the catapults, the leaders, everything. So if nothing else, this discourages players from rolling dice near or directly on the map. I also created a basic chart or mat with holding boxes that records the turn order sequence. And I have spaces to store faction markers, banked or saved talents, the coins, holding spaces for captured generals. It helps so much to keep all these things organized. And you could easily make your own that would look a lot better than the one that I use. Um, and of course, if you incorporate random events that add new things to the game, Make sure you have multiple copies of customized player aids that reflect and explain well everything that's going to be relevant. Here's the one that I use. You can see it's at least twice as detailed as the original one, but it's still super easy to understand. And you can see it has the barbarians, elephants, ship and cavalry advancement rules all summarized on it. Now for some gameplay tips. Okay, so the very nature of Conquest of the Empire encourages fluid player alliances and negotiations back and forth over things like mutual protection arrangements or discussions regarding the fate of captured generals. Will they be eliminated, exchanged, or ransomed for talents? So you may have to find a way to limit the amount of time players can spend talking or arguing about this stuff, unless you don't care if the game drags on and on for hours. Agree on a house rule that might go something like this. Whenever a player captures a general, any other player has one opportunity to bid or pay a ransom. But if there are no takers, then the general is eliminated from the game. It all depends on what style of game your group prefers, of course, or how argumentative you are willing to let things get. Just be aware that in games like this, where players are backstabbing and double crossing each other, Agreed upon limitations can help prevent arguments that bog the action down. And finally, my best gameplay advice is as follows. Completely disregard the original rules with respect to how they suggest the game should be played according to the various player counts. These are on page eight of the rule book and they are bad suggestions. <laughs> with two players, they want one player to be Egypt and one to be Hispania and you would expand from opposite uh, ends of the map and meet somewhere in the middle. No, this game is called, was called Six Caesars for a reason before Milton Bradley got on board. No matter how many players you have, there are six Caesars in the game. Players can control multiple factions in this. It's not hard to manage multiple colors. Player turns are fast anyway. Figure it out. Always six factions. As a matter of fact, the game is totally awesome with two players, with mods and random events, 
as long as one side has Italia and one starts with Egyptus. So player one controls Macedonia, Egyptus, and Hispania. Player two controls Galatia, Numidia, and Italia. Play until one of the alliances loses its first home province or a team wins if they force a Caesar to flee their home province. If you play this way, there is a constant dilemma for either side. Each player has one extremely vulnerable power to protect. And how do they do this? Each player has strengths and weaknesses, and both of them must balance offensive and defensive strategies if they want to win the game. This style of game lasts a few hours usually. Now, I've talked a lot about conquest of the empire in this video, so I'll wrap it up with an interesting anecdote. More than a few times, I've had friends over and we've decided we wanted to play a game uh, while we watched um, a movie or sports or something on TV. And I'll always ask, well, what do you want to play? Pick something. And the person will look at the games on my shelf, which isn't a huge collection. Honestly, maybe like 25 big box types at most. But still, some of them are pretty obscure. And some people might even say like grail type titles that you just don't see very often. And more than once, I swear this is true. I've had this happen. Different people have looked right past everything else and said, I want to play that. And they point to Conquest of the Empire. I'm telling you, the game just has the it factor. It has the right stuff. The box art just draws you in, I'm telling you. You can see it there. I was a kid when the MB Games Master series came out and all the other titles I saw on the store at one time or another. And yeah, I even remember seeing broadsides and boarding parties on the shelves briefly. I remember it was expensive as hell. I couldn't afford it, but I never saw a conquest of the empire. You just couldn't get it. But when you bought Axis and Allies and it came with an inner promo, promo sheet or ad, I guess you would call it, it would have a picture of Conquest of the Empire, no other on information at all. And this is before the internet too. And your mind was just like blown as a kid. You would say like, wait, what? Roman armies and battles? Sign me up. This looks awesome. But it had that, you know, you can't have it um, aspect to it. And I had to wait many years before I got my own copy. It wasn't until eBay became a thing before I got it. Anyway, I still find this game lives up to all the hype. It's great with mods. It's awesome. So with this video, I hope I've encouraged you to take a second look at what I believe is a truly unique and fun classic 1980s area control masterpiece. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more content coming soon.